Welcome to a new Tech Barcelona online build. Today we have the great opportunity to have on board our corporate partner, Go Global E-Commerce, in a session titled Cross-Border E-Commerce and the New European Regulations. From 1st July 2021, a new regulation on VAT was approved. This was a priority measure to ensure a single digital market strategy. The Go Global E-Commerce experts will analyze that important e-commerce new regulation, explaining the basics of the new rules implemented on July 1st, the implementation of the OSS registration, and what are the cases where the old system is maintained, pros and cons of the new regulation, type of businesses that will be most affected by the bad changes, and general risks for brands. Now, Daniel Minera, Chief Global Expansion Officer at Go Global E-Commerce, will offer us a brief introduction of the cross-border e-commerce situation in Europe and the changes that are taking place at the moment here. After that, Veronica Comito, Legal Advisor for Go Global E-Commerce, will go with the presentation of the European regulations for e-commerce. As usually, last part of the session is a Q&A to give our audience the opportunity to ask our, our experts. So please, Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Tony. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, at uh, Go Global E-Commerce. We've been working for over 21 years, uh, helping companies uh, overcome all the obstacles uh, that means uh, selling online uh, abroad. Uh, we, we offer the best solutions uh, out of our all expertise and knowledge uh, to help them grow internationally. We are based in Barcelona, Torino, Dublin, and New York, and, and from there, we can help uh, companies expand uh, globally, the US, Europe, Asia, Latin America. So happy to be here to give a, a little glimpse of uh, what the cross-border e-commerce is, what the opportunities are. And also with Veronica later on knowing all the regulations uh, regarding the VAT in Europe. So I'm gonna share my screen uh, now, uh, if you allow me to, to tell you a little bit about, do, do you see my screen? Is it, uh, is it shown? Do you see the presentation? I think it's charging it. Uh, uh, sorry. I lost it. No, it's not this one. Sorry. It's the last minute change. And uh, I think I lost it. <laughs> sorry. Just one second. I'm going to find what it is. I don't know why it's not showing. Uh, let me try it again. Well, as I said, I'm going to be uh, showing you all all the different um, perspective on, on uh, what's happening today in the cross-border e-commerce all over the world. I think I lost the connection now, so I'm <laughs> looking for it. Here we go. Let me see if now you see it. Uh, no. Do you see it? Go global. It's blank. I okay. No. Sorry. Apologize. Apologize for this last minute thing. So many things open. Anyway, I'm I'm gonna start talking anyway. Uh, meanwhile, I'll I'll look for it. Uh, otherwise, we'll be we'll be looking for it uh, over and over. Uh, what I was saying is that um, the the expected growth uh, for the uh, for the market uh, in the in the coming years is is spectacular expected to grow by 2022 100% from 2019. So it's a, it's a huge uh, uh, growth for cross-border e-commerce in, in Europe. Uh, that means that uh, we have a big challenge uh, ahead of us. Uh, let me see if I can see it now. Do you see it now, the screen? Now, now it's good. No. Sorry, sorry. I, I, I lost it for a second. I apologize for that. Anyway, uh, what I was saying is that uh, the expected growth uh, for uh, for 2022 is 100% coming from uh, 2019, 108 billion euro business. So it's uh, it is true, and it's it's obvious that uh, COVID-19 has been a, a big boost in online sales uh, globally. Um, Buyers all over the world are realizing that they can get goods and services from companies and brands from all over the world and vice versa. Um, brands are realizing that they can reach into customers that are all the, in other parts of the world. So this brings a, a big opportunity today, more concentrated in the European market. 
uh, and all the opportunities that the European market are bringing us. Um, the, the proportion of online shoppers is, is growing spectacularly in, in Europe. Uh, more and more uh, are, are growing every year in every region, uh, especially concentration of growth in, in South Europe and also in all the Eastern countries. Obviously, uh, countries like France, UK, Germany, or, or the Nordic countries are more mature already in terms of uh, online. So those are the ones that are growing less. And uh, in terms of uh, turnover, uh, is growing as well, uh, a very highly rate all over Europe. We're talking about uh, 146 billion business, Euro billion business in Europe right now. Uh, if you see the main countries like um, Germany, UK, France, Spain, Italy, Sweden, I mean, you see a, a growth of 30, 20, 25, uh, even 36 percent. So this is a, a very high uh, increase, a double digit increase that is going to keep growing. Um, let's take a look a little bit about uh, some of the, the, the key countries that can give us some information about the value of the market and the opportunities. Uh, here in Spain, we have a 7.2 billion euro cross-border e-commerce uh, market uh, uh, by 2021. 26% growth is expected for companies that are already implementing, developing uh, strategies uh, in order to, to be able to export uh, in, during this year. Uh, the main reasons why they are not developing even faster or better is because either they lack information or qualified uh, personnel and uh, the logistics aspects. You know, it's a key issue how to, to address uh, correctly in international logistics. And it's expected by 2025, a big growth of the market. 74% of the population uh, will be already an online shopper. Uh, fashion will be growing to 8.7 billion, electronics and media to 6.7 billion. There is obviously uh, an omni-channel strategy in most, uh, in most um, let's say, uh, retailers where they're using the physical stores more like uh, showrooms and, and it's the online business that takes all the, let's say, the attention. Italy is also a market that is growing uh, fastly in the south of Europe. Uh, we have an increment of 17% uh, between 2017 and 2021. And it's going to be even growing uh, by six point, uh, points more in by, by 2024. 60% um, of the Italian brands are already doing cross-border e-commerce. Those are probably uh, some of the strongest uh, brands internationally known. Uh, in our case, for instance, out of our uh, base of clients, we have about 81% of our Italian customers already selling in, in cross-border, uh, especially US, France, and Germany. But uh, Asia, Russia are two countries that are really growing uh, fast uh, lately. And the turnover for, for e-commerce is uh, growing, you know, very much a, a good path. France, one of the mature countries in, in Europe, has 79% uh, of online shoppers that are already, um, you know, cross-border shoppers. 60% of the consumers already made purchases in 2021. And it's expected to increase 33%, and the total of uh, revenue from all over the categories is by 2025. So it means even mature countries are growing at a at a grow uh, big path. Netherlands, uh, an interesting case uh, with uh, less than around 15% of population, a little bit more. Uh, they have already five million cross-border uh, buyers. Uh, it's it's a country that is also growing. Uh, fastly, 23% uh, year on year, uh, you know, percentage of uh, CBE markets, cross border e-commerce, and a curious data, if you want to sell products or services in, in Holland, you need to have ideal as a purchasing method, uh, which is almost 70% of the all the online purchases in, in the Netherlands. So it's important to think that we're growing internationally, but we need to think in a local or more uh, local experiences. Germany as well, another very mature uh, market uh, with 79% of uh, cross-border shoppers, uh, with a 39% online shoppers making already cross-border purchases as a constant basis. So very mature market, but still a market that can grow into 29.4 billion value for uh, 2025. So we're talking about big uh, big numbers here. So in a nutshell, it is clear that the, the 
cross-border e-commerce is, is booming. Uh, this is not longer a, a nice to have, something I would think has to be part of the core of the business strategy. If you're a brand, if you're present in the market, and if you want to exist, you need to be cross-border e-commerce uh, uh, compliant, <laughs> to say it in a way. Uh, online shoppers are realizing that in Europe, uh, they can buy uh, easier. The cost of shipments are not too high. Delivery is quite short. So it means it's a great, huge opportunity for brands that want to expand uh, internationally out of their own country in Europe. So le let's do it. So what's new now, as, as uh, Tony said and mentioned before, there's new regulations in the European Union. Uh, the European Union is working on, on facilitating all the e-commerce process for countries all over uh, the European Union. We had regulations about uh, GDPR, PSD2, and, and others. And now there is a new VAT regulation, and uh, Veronica Comito is going to be talking to us about it. So uh, I'll let you, Veronica, to, to continue with the explanation. OK. Thank you, Daniel. OK, hello. Um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, with all the audience today. I'm Veronica Comito. I'm a legal advisor at Go Global E-commerce. Um, I, my activity is based in Turin, and I'm focused on contractual law. But the new VAT regulation, uh, I think, is going to have a huge impact on companies and businesses. So even from the contractual law perspective, it is very interesting to know something more about this new regulation. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Hope everything works well and in time. OK. I start the presentation. Just a moment now. Just a few seconds. <laughs> Again, a <laughs> little bit of a problem. In Italy, we say that is the beauty of going uh, live. It's the, the funny part <laughs> of going live. OK. I try it's to. It's working. Oh. OK. You, can you see the presentation? Just for a second. OK, no, but I'm afraid. No, but just uh, my problem. OK, present from the beginning. OK, now I think here we are. Can you see the, the screen? So this is just a brief introduction. OK, let's start. OK, so when we talk uh, uh, about VAT, um, we have to talk about uh, uh, Europe, uh, as we already mentioned. Uh, VAT is a European tax. Um, you know, European Union um, has many different member states. So. Since uh, 2006, uh, every different member state had um, its proper regulation. And then starting from, starting from 2006, uh, we've had the general VAT regulation. Um, You're not sharing the presentation. It was, it was hoping. Sorry? You are not sharing the, the I'm not sharing the screen? Oh, OK. No. Now, can you see it? Yes. Now, okay. yes. OK, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tony. OK, um, so we are talking about Europe. We are talking about a European tax. So we have to start from the, the general consideration that when goods come to Europe, we have to we have VAT issues. When goods go abroad Europe, where go outside the European Union, well, OK, we don't have such uh, such issues. Um, what has changed? Uh, I said that the first uh, European directive is in uh, 2006, but recently we have uh, we have seen changes. Why we have seen such changes? Because of the uh, intrinsic uh, um, characteristics of the VAT. Uh, VAT is a general tax I mentioned, and uh, um, it is a tax that. It's applicable when we have importation in Europe. Um, there was a general exemption before July, so um, producers and sellers from about the Europe had uh, an advantage of um, took a, can uh, took an advantage on this. Uh, and so, uh, in order to go beyond such a distortion of the competition uh, for mm -hmm. European producers and sellers, we have had uh, um, the the new rules few words uh, just to, to make a simple recap of what VAT is. It is a general tax 
takes uh, it is upon uh, all types of uh, of selling a consumption tax because we pay it as a final consumers as a percentage of the price um, and it is collected by the seller and fractionally so on every single sell purchase operation uh, it is a neutral tax uh, because uh, um, it is a applicable regardless of the um, income amount, uh, regardless of uh, income limit. Okay, uh, we still see in Europe different VAT rates. Uh, it is at least 15%, uh, but it can be reduced and we have an exhaustive list. Uh, we can always uh, um, make a check of the VAT rate applicable uh, using the, the tool of the European uh, Commission. Uh, as we said, with the, uh, with the boom of e-commerce, as Daniel mentioned before, uh, a change was needed. A change was needed because uh, we had a general, uh, as I mentioned, a general VAT exemption for the um, importation of really low value goods. Uh, and of course, we had uh, an exemption also for the self Chase operation um, and European consumers and producers. Um, well, of course, there was a distortion of the competition, and the producers and consumers abroad took advantage. So um, the changes um, have um, have been in two ways. Uh, we have the first, the new v, the new Article 14.A, the dim supply provision on one hand. Uh, so. Um, um, VAT is collected more effectively in Europe because uh, we have a DIM supplier that collects VAT um, on the final consumer and, uh, uh, and checks VAT on such operation. Uh, on the other hand, there has been a simplification of the uh, collection and uh, rating operation. Uh, there are uh, the schemes, the one-stop shop scheme and the import one-stop shop scheme. Let's start from the DIM supplier provision because uh, uh, it is very interesting for startups. It is very interesting for all those companies uh, uh, who uh, work as a, um, as a person facilitating the sell purchase process. Uh, many startups uh, um, uh, do have a marketplace. Uh, many startups supply e-commerce platform to other businesses. So they are um, so they are affected by this provision. Um, it is going to be the taxable person facilitating the sell purchase through the uh, electronic interface that is uh, considered as um, a DIM supplier. This is the schema of the DIM supplier provision. Uh, you know, law uh, sometimes is a bit complicated. Um, because not only a uh, new provision applies always. So we always have to ask ourselves uh, when we uh, manage an electronic interface, uh, we have to ask what times, what, what, uh, what type of supply we are managing in that moment. Um, we have to ask ourselves if we are uh, facilitating the sell purchase of goods dispatched from a third country or a territory to European Union. And if the answer is yes, or if the answer is no, but goods are sold by a supplier which is not established in the, in the European Union, uh, we will be considered as deemed supplier. And so we have uh, the obligations in order to uh, collect VAT, in order to register VAT. Uh, we see there is a sort of, in such cases, we see there is a sort of split of the supply. Uh, because the, uh, we have the electronic interface. If we, every one of us, uh, we may think uh, um, uh, when we when we made uh, some uh, some uh, online purchase, we are customers, we are consumers. Uh, we just uh, um, we just made the sell purchase process within the electronic interface. But sometimes the producer or the seller is not the same person who owns the electronic interface. So we have an underlying supplier, which is the producer or the seller, and then the European customer. This is the main B2C supply, which is split into two operations. The underlying supplier 
uh, supply the electronic interface, we are talking about B2B, and then the electronic interface makes the supply with the, um, the European customer, the final, uh, the final customer of the operation. Uh, that's why this, is, this team is very important, because the electronic interface becomes a detectable person who has to collect and register the VAT. So this is a, a bit of a revolution, uh, and, and that's because European Union is meant to uh, really collect uh, VAT effectively, uh, regardless uh, uh, the country where the goods come from, uh, but using and putting responsibilities and liabilities on electronic interface. The key word is facilitating, you know, <laughs> as I said before, lawyers, while we were talking, uh, uh, lawyers are a bit boring, but words are very important. Maybe one single word may change uh, the interpretation and the interpretation may change the rule applicable. So um, if you want to know if uh, your business can be a DIM supplier, if you own a, or you manage an electronic interface, uh, you have to uh, wonder and, and trust yourself if you are facilitating the same purchase process. If you only manage the payment, you are not facilitating uh, the uh, self-purchase process. So uh, you have to do something more. Um, however, uh, pay attention to the type of, acti of activity you do and the types of the supplies that uh, you manage with your platform if your business is, um, is that way. So, I said there is, of course, uh, uh, obligations in, in terms of invoicing, recording, and keeping, of course, the, the record of VAT. Uh, it would be a, a bit long to make a list of all the obligations, but uh, you can use the um, VAT explanatory notes from the European Commission. I would suggest you to keep it on your desk because uh, um, they give you the... Uh, um, the most correct interpretation of the new rules. So if uh, the tax authority has to assess or reassess something uh, and you refer to the uh, explanatory notes of the European Commission, you are sure you have the right interpretation and so you are safe, especially if you are, if you manage an electronic interface and so if you are a deemed supplier. Um, you have, of course, a limited responsibility. As we said before, um, if, we, um, if an electronic interface is a DIM supplier, remember, we have a split of the supply. So we, de we are dependent and we rely on the information that the underlying supplier gives us. So we can be liable for a runaway VAT payment only in case the uh, information is uh, incorrect uh, is incorrect and we could not reasonably know that the information was incorrect so if i am an if i manage an electronic interface my underlying supplier gives me erroneous information i'm not liable but i have to prove that i could not know reasonably that that information was incorrect so uh, you pay attention to the information you receive from the underlying supplier before uh, you you manage the sale purchase uh, procedure on your uh, electronic interface let's say uh, to provide the counterpart with the correct information is the normal fair play so uh, there shouldn't be many problems but however pay attention to this and then we arrive to the, to the schemes. So, as I said, we have a more effective collection of VAT, so um, a heavier burden on businesses. But on the other hand, in some cases, we may have a simplification using the one-stop shop or the import one-stop shop scheme. What does one-stop shop mean? One-stop shop means that in some cases, I can have a unique interlocutor in order to uh, pay and declare VAT. So uh, I have a, a unique member state of registration uh, for VAT purposes, and, and it is a, a huge simplification. Um, let's say, however, because you know, when, uh, uh, when there is a rule, of course, there are always exceptions and also cases where that rule is not applicable. Um, you can't use one-stop shop or uh, import one-stop shops in any case. 
Why? Because, for example, if you do have a warehouse in a member state, in that member state where you have a warehouse, you will have to open a VAT position. So you won't be able to use the, uh, the simplified scheme, and you should, uh, but you should, uh, you should um, use the, the old scheme, so the traditional scheme, and pay VAT through that position. So simplification, but not a total simplification. Let's start from the one-stop shop scheme. Uh, as you see, we can have the union scheme. Um, and for the union scheme, so we are talking about, we'll see what types of supplies and taxable persons. But now to have, uh, to have access to the simplifying uh, mechanism and scheme, um, you just have to go beyond the new threshold, which is unique all around Europe, and it's uh, 10,000 euros. Before the new regulation, thresholds were different from, uh, from between different countries. So um, there were uh, some businesses who didn't go beyond the threshold and could collect and pay the VAT according to the regulation of their own country. Um, now uh, the threshold is lower and unique for all Europe. And so if you go beyond the threshold, you can use, in certain cases, of course, the uh, union scheme one-stop shop scheme also for non-union uh, taxable persons, and then the import one-stop shop scheme. So we've had uh, a ge the, um, the general exemption for really low value goods um, up to 22 euro is abolished. So we don't have uh, any more any general exempt, uh, exemption from VAT. However, we can use the simplified scheme if, uh, um, if we sell low value goods imported from third countries. Countries. So we have uh, goods imported from third countries that are dispatched in Europe in consignments uh, whose low intrinsic value is up to uh, 150 euros. In that case, we can we should collect VAT uh, from the consumers, but we can use the simplify mechanism. Uh, again, um, I don't want to go too much in detail, but uh, always ask yourself in order to understand what uh, what scheme you should use. Uh, what types of what type of supply am I managing with? What type of supply am I doing? Uh, depending on the type of supply, I will have I will be able to uh, apply the uh, one-stop shop non-union or union scheme, or maybe the import stop shop scheme. Uh, I have to, um, to match this schema, the, this overview, with another general overview. So what kind of taxable person am I? Am I established in European Union or am I established outside the European Union? Uh, do I manage with um, import operations or not? Um, and depending on the answer, uh, we, we will have, uh, we know what scheme will be applicable. Um, I know it's a bit complicated uh, and uh, lawyers, a lawyer's life is always complicated, but it is very important to know in uh, what part of the scheme we, we should, uh, we say in, in what part of the scheme. Remember the two answer, the two questions that every business has always to make when uh, when you work is what type of supply am I doing and what type of, of taxable person am I? Uh, of course, regarding the Europe, we are talking about the European market because VAT is a typical European issue. Uh, just a, a few images to focus on what is one sub shop scheme. I think that you all know <laughs> this uh, um, uh, these images, uh, I put some uh, some logos of the um, uh, tax authorities, the, the most important national tax authorities. Uh, in Italy, we have Agenzia delle Entrate. I think that, that uh, audience from Spain knows very well Agenzia Tributaria. So, um, why uh, why these images? Uh, to focus uh, on the fact that if the if the one stop shop scheme is applicable we have only a unique interlocutor um, so life is simpler uh, but we don't have to uh, we have to to remember that not in any case we can have uh, this uh, such simplification uh, remember if you have a warehouse in a member state for example, you have to open a VAT position in that member state. So, for example, if your business is uh, established in Italy, but you have a warehouse in 
France, you can't use the one-stop shop scheme with Agenzia delle Entrate Italiana, but you have to open a VAT position even in France. So uh, simplification, but something um, is, uh, is complicated again. Uh, then, just a few words about the import one-stop shop scheme um, we see all the passages the important thing is that uh, when we have uh, goods uh, imported from third countries or third territories the seller pays the VAT because uh, when uh, I accept when the order is accepted from my um, from uh, the from the from my counterpart uh, as a seller, I pay the VAT, so I pay the price including the VAT, then I ship goods to Europe. Of course, we have some customs checks uh, and then the delivery at the destination. Uh, I have to declare and pay VAT in the member state uh, in which the goods are delivered. Uh, of course, let's say we are, uh, of course, in cases where the IO schema is applicable, and it is a simplification because uh, the import operation will be exempt from VAT and uh, me as a supplier or a DIM supplier, if I am an electronic interface, I have to collect the VAT. Just to summarize, uh, let's imagine that we are an electronic interface. Many of you are, I think, so, uh, many companies that <laughs> maybe are hearing us uh, are in this situation. I manage my electronic interface, so I have to obtain an um, iOS registration. Uh, then the VAT will be charged when I purchase the goods. Um, I have the importation, so I take goods from a third country to Europe. That, uh, that operation will be exempt from VAT, but then I have to collect the VAT regarding the place where the, where the destination of the goods is. So I have to declare and pay the VAT and keep it, uh, of course, the reports. Uh, there is a sort of dialogue from tax administration to custom office back to tax administration uh, authority, because uh, the tax administration gives you an IOS VAT identification number. The custom office checks it uh, and so releases the goods for free circulation and then again the tax administration of that country will rate the VAT returns. Uh, it, is, um, it is harder to explain it than, than doing it. Um, however, uh, you have to remember that if uh, you sell um, imported goods from a third country and that goods are dispatched in consignment uh, uh, up to 150 euro of intrinsic value, you can apply this uh, uh, simplified scheme. So just a few, um, just a few quick view on what has changed and what is again <laughs> like, uh, like before. Um, about VAT, we see that after the 1st of July, we don't have a general VAT exemption anymore. As I mentioned, the European Union decided to intervene in order to protect uh, European producers and, uh, and sellers. Um, nothing has changed from the, for uh, the, the customs duty. So customs duty uh, have a different uh, regulation. Um, just a uh, uh, um, just few words because uh, I, as I mentioned, the import one-stop shop scheme may be used by taxable person established in Europe or not established in Europe both. Uh, if the taxable person wanting to use the uh, um, IOS scheme isn't established in Europe, might need an intermediary. Uh, there is a checklist always in the explanatory notes published from the, com the European Commission at page 56. Uh, you can open the link, you can take note of the link and then open it at page 56. You will see the different cases in which you will need an intermediary or when the intermediary is not needed. Then just a few words on special arrangements, uh, because of course, when there is a, car a, a carrier or um, a custom uh, assistant uh, at custom office, uh, that, uh, that, that person is one who has to declare and pay VAT. And then, uh, of course, there is an agreement with the, uh, with the seller and, um, and the importer, but uh, these are special provisions. So um, 
the the thing we have to take into we we have to remember that the most uh, um, affected types of businesses are small and medium businesses uh, because uh, uh, as I mentioned before the new regulation uh, small and medium businesses didn't go beyond the, the VAT threshold and so they could pay and uh, register VAT in their own countries following their own rules now the threshold is lower and so even small medium businesses have to <laughs> have to ask themselves if they uh, have to manage VAT with the new regulation electronic interface facilitating sales of goods will be uh, hugely affected by this uh, by this changing because now they have to collect VAT so this is a new this is a little bit of a revolution um, and then of course import businesses because there is not a general exemption anymore and so you always have to uh, ask yourself if the, the, the goods important are dispatched uh, in consignments and the value of these consignments so pros and cons, uh, as you see, it's not so easy to say because uh, we have a simplification on the one hand, and it is a pro, but we also have the stop of the general exemption. So uh, this is a con, of course. Um, in the European space, uh, rules are uniform, but uh, as a con, we have a challenge from, for businesses from outside the European Union. So, um, as I said uh, at, the, at the beginning, uh, the European Union meant to protect uh, European producers and sellers. So, for uh, businesses from outside the European Union, can be difficult to, to make business in the European market. Uh, however, there is an exit strategy I mentioned at the end. Um, a pro is the unique threshold for the Union scheme, but this is at the same time a con because of the many types of businesses, as I mentioned, will be affected by such, uh, such changes. Uh, of course, uh, a pro is for the European Union, a larger amount of VAT collected, but for businesses, of course, it is a burden. Uh, an exit strategy may be to, um, to have a business partner um, that can be a merchant on records. So if my business is outside the Europe and I want to, um, to make business with, with European consumers and the European market, um, it is advisable to have a European business partner uh, that can be my merchant on records. And so that, uh, that will be my business partner, partner uh, as a DIM supplier maybe, that will bear the burden of new costs and, uh, and new compliance with such new regulations. Thank you. Uh, and so I look forward to hear your questions. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, very, very interesting information. Uh, we have received some questions about the audience. And so the first is for you. And Talking about these schemes, says, are the new schemes compulsory? Uh, no, the schemes are not compulsory. Uh, they can be useful because, uh, as I mentioned before, if uh, I'm a taxable person who can apply such scheme, and if I do the type of supplies covered by the new regulation, um, apply the one-stop shop scheme can be very, very simple for me. Uh, but I can choose to do uh, the, in the traditional way. Okay, thank you. The next one is for Daniel and says, how can an e-commerce partner help companies to be compliant? Well, I mean, um, a partner, what uh, Veronica said uh, very well before in, in, the, in the resume she did uh, for the presentation is that when you have a partner, you have a merchant of record, uh, is the partner that is uh, aware of all the regulations and all the taxes and duties that uh, the, the company, the brand must pay in the, in the country of destination. So while working in Europe, the best thing is that uh, to know uh, have a good partner, to work with a good partner that uh, can do deal and comply with whatever regulations, it might be environmental regulations, it might be uh, e-commerce, uh, uh, it, might, it might be security regulations. Is always very important because European Union is, is probably one of the most advanced regions in the world in legislating and protecting consumers. So uh, get a good partner always. Okay, interesting. So now, Veronica, um, is the new VAT regulation considered good 
or bad or, or bad food businesses? Um, uh, it depends uh, on uh, on the perspective uh, you use. Um, as we saw during the presentation, as I mentioned before, uh, a simplification is always good. But uh, of, first of all, you have to um, any time to to check. Uh, if you can use such simplification. Uh, and then, uh, well, from a general perspective, um, the world uh, is, is becoming smaller. Uh, people uh, now have relationships uh, with um, all over the world. Uh, and, uh, and so new burdens on e-commerce uh, protection that Europe has, uh, uh, has put in place, uh, well, I don't know if it, if it will be good for all businesses, maybe for European businesses, but not for the global commerce. So this is a challenge, of course, uh, and, and that is the reason why uh, maybe uh, having a merchant on record uh, is, uh, is the most advisable solution. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to answer. Mm, good for some, for some aspects and bad for, for other issues. Following that, uh, someone says, what could be the risks? What should the brand watch out for? Well, uh, the risk, the risk, uh, the main risk is to um, is to have a reassessment from uh, uh, tax authority. Uh, we know that tax authorities are very precise in rating and uh, calculate the um, return or payment or taxes and also VAT. Um, as we said, as we, as I mentioned before, um, we have some limitations of liability. Uh, however, for business, it's very important not to have reassessment for tax authority because this would be a cost and, and a risk. Uh, then, you know, um, for example, in Italy, when there is litigation with counterparts or uh, or tax administration, uh, you you never know how it ends. Uh, litigation is complex. Uh, litigation uh, takes time. So uh, the best thing is try to reduce uh, such risk. Um, contracts have a, have an important role because, uh, um, as I mentioned before I, I can look for a business partner uh, I make a contract with my business partner uh, in the contract we establish beforehand what are the liability what, uh, what are the um, what uh, who does who does what uh, and so this is uh, an important uh, an important instrument to uh, to reduce the risks okay thank you Veronica. now I think the next is for Daniel and says, what are the benefits of working with a solution like Merchant and Record with selling online internationally? Well, I mean, uh, the, the, the advantage is that um, the, the complexity of building your own infrastructure uh, and to building the knowledge that you have to have in order, for instance, to sell in, in Europe, uh, it takes money and resources and time. So um, most companies, they come, for instance, to us uh, because uh, we have the knowledge, we have the, the team, we have uh, the technologies uh, to be able to deal with uh, all the duties and tax management, to deal with uh, the legal compliance, to deal with uh, perhaps plus 20 different methods of payments here in, in Europe, to, to be able to build a, a more uh, localized shopping experience, to take care of returns, cashbacks, and, and, and obviously, to take care of, uh, of uh, a place where you have many languages, different languages where you can have euros, but you can have pounds. Or if you are uh, going to the UK, you, you have to deal with pounds, um, customer service, international logistics. The complexity is, is huge. It's big in terms of uh, selling online. And, and this is a big challenge for companies. And, and we help companies building the, the right strategy and implementing the right strategies no? and, and helping them along the way, along the path. So uh, I think if you need to start, uh, the best way to do it is, is with a merchant of record, a company like us, for instance, but uh, there are many other companies that can do it. And uh, with time, if you can build your own team uh, and expertise, then you will be able to, to do it. But just for you to know, I mean, um, big corporations and small companies are having the same issues. Uh, ones because they don't have the, the, the infrastructure or the resources and the big ones because they don't have the knowledge and the, the, the capacity to address 
a more specialized issues on, on, on cross-border e-commerce. So uh, it's a good solution and uh, always a good way to start. Okay, thank you. I think that is the last one for Veronica. Uh, talking about these cases, no, says, are there cases where the old system is maintained? I think you commented before, but that's a question. Well, uh, as I mentioned before, um, the warehouse where you have warehouse and you do uh, and your goods are stopped, uh, you have to open a VAT position in that member state. Uh, in that case, you can't use the new schemes. Um, then uh, we saw that uh, the, um, the new schemes are replicable depending on the type of supply. And so uh, if you don't do such type of supply cover, covered by the new regulation, uh, of course, the old scheme will be uh, applicable. Uh, you know, uh, the, the new regulation um, has, uh, has changed something, has introduced the deemed supplier provision. So this is uh, uh, the, biggest, uh, <laughs> the biggest change, uh, um, but, does, but hasn't changed uh, all the VAT regulation. Uh, so what, uh, what hasn't been covered from the, uh, from the new regulation uh, keeps on going like the traditional, in the traditional way. So uh, VAT position in every country where you have warehouses or you sell uh, or you sell things. Um, so the, the challenge is to <laughs> is to make types of supplies covered by the by the new regulation in order to to have a simplification. Perfect. So that's all. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Veronica, for your time and uh, you, for your very interesting online bill from today. Thank you all the audience for the attention and stay tuned for new Tech Barcelona activities and online bills. Okay, bye. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.